Let us turn to our first lesson this morning, the book of Jeremiah, our Old Testament lesson today, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 1 through 6. At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness, Israel, when I went to give him rest. And the Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I will draw you, and I have drawn you. And I will build you, and you shall be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. You shall again be adorned with your tambourines, and you shall go forth in the dances of those who rejoice. You shall yet plant vines on the mountains of Samaria. The planter shall plant and eat them as ordinary food. For there shall be a day when the watchman will cry on Mount Ephraim, Arise, and let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. The epistle lesson this morning, Paul's uh, first letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 13. The greatest gift. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but if I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will fail. And whether there are tongues, they will cease. And whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But then when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The gospel reading today is from the fourth gospel, the gospel of John, chapter 15 beginning at verses 9 through verse 17. Love and joy perfected. As the Father loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and I abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you to do. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Here ends the reading. Let us pray before the preaching of God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray that uh, your word would be spoken with truth and authority and with power this day. We pray, Lord God, that for each person listening, that they would be inspired and edified, that the Christian love that we share together and the fellowship of your Son, Jesus Christ, would be felt and experienced in this time and in this place today. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Different languages have broader and vaguer concepts of ideas. For example, among the Inuit people, whom we more commonly know in our society as Eskimos, there are more than a dozen different words for the concept of snow. So there's heavy, moist snow, there's the drier snow, and everything in between. I'm sure I wouldn't be able to distinguish one from the other by looking at it. But they have 12, at least 12, if not even more, different ideas when talking to each other about how to describe what the snow is like that's falling. And there are other languages that have very vague concepts of things that we tend to be more distinct about. Like in the Spanish language, the, the concepts of waiting for something and hoping for something is the same word. The word esperar means to hope and to wait. So they make no distinction whether you're you know, waiting for somebody with the anticipation that they will be coming or whether with the anticipation that they might be coming. It's the same idea in Spanish. And so in English, we are very poor in our concept of the specificity with love. Because we talk about love in many different ways. As you've, you know, you've noticed this in your own lives, you say, I love my spouse, I love my children. And then a, a sentence or a paragraph or a thought later, you might say, I love pepperoni pizza. <laughs> or I love this color carpet or whatever. I mean, it's quite a difference in meaning when you really think about it. Greek, the language that uh, the New Testament was written in, is much more specific when speaking about love. And so we're glad for that, so that when those who can read Greek can know this, they can tell us what kind of love are we talking about when the scriptures mention love. And so it is that we dive into that this morning, thinking on 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 9, the commandment that is good for us to remember at all times. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who has been born of God and knows God loves God. For whoever does not love, does not know God, because God is love. And this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. And what an appropriate verse to think on, because if you say that you love God, but you have no love for your brother, the scriptures tell us that you are a liar. And so it is this morning we think about love. And the first word in the Greek New Testament that helps talk about love that we find in the Bible is the word agape. And that's a word that you probably have heard. There was a coffee shop in New London years ago named the Agape Coffee House. And it had kind of a religious theme to it, too. Agape means God's love, unconditional love. It's the selfless love that loves with even without an expectation that that love will be reciprocated. This is the kind of love that God has for the world. And in particular, this is the kind of love that God has for you. We remember that famous verse that was our watch this morning that uh, Melinda so aptly picked out for us, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son that whoever, so whoever should believe in him should not perish, but to have eternal life. This is the kind of love that made the father send his son into the world to suffer the absolute worst that the world could heap upon him because he still loved us anyway. While we were yet sinners, Christ still died for us. Now you and I, if you are a believer, and I certainly hope that you are, that we are not so great at times about showing agape love to one another. With our brothers and sisters in Christ, within our households, we snap at one another, and it's I seem to notice anyway, and maybe you've noticed this in your life as well, that the people that you're the most short with are usually the people that are the closest to you. Because you know you have the freedom to do that. If you do that to a stranger, they're just going to walk away and never care about you again. But if you say something kind of snarky to one of your family members, you just expect them to take it. So we must think this morning on the true depth of what God's love is and how it should dwell among us and in our hearts. The word agape is the most commonly used word for love in the scriptures, and that makes sense because the scriptures are God's love letter to us, as people have said. You know, for like 1 Corinthians 13, our epistle lesson for today, we could just switch out agape because that was the word that it was written in Greek. Agape is patient. Agape is kind. It does uh, n makes no record of wrong. Now, interestingly, and some of you might have noticed this when you were reading your Bibles as we were uh, reading that scripture verse today in chapter 13, 
that sometimes the word is translated as charity. In the King James Version, that's how it's read. Faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity. And that makes sense. And see, in, the, in, that, in that sense, those two concepts overlap. Because love isn't just talk. It has to have action to it. There has to be something behind it that shows something. You can tell your spouse a hundred times, oh, I love you. But then if you just forget to buy a present on birthday or Christmas or do nice things or say compliments once in a while, it probably isn't love. There has to be something behind it. And that's why, of course, that God shows his love for us in Christ Jesus. So we see those concepts coming together. Faith, hope, and love, or faith, hope, and charity, or agape, as one would say in Greek. It's not the kind of love or the kind of interaction that expects something in return. True love, like God's love, is love that gives without expecting that reciprocation. It's not the kind of, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. As we know that God loves the whole world, and God loves each person in the world, that God loves you and God is crazy about you even though you might not hardly give him a second thought. And so that's why God rejoices. The angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner comes home. Think how exciting it is. Just think of your own family. If there's somebody who had wandered away from you and had come back all those years later. What a joy that was. You still love that child, even though that child has done everything in his or her power to do things that made you ashamed or hurt you. But yet there's love. And if you think of that love, and then think how much more and expansive and how broad God's love is for your soul. Now the second word that is found in the scriptures that we would translate as love in English is the word philia, P-H-I-L-I-A. And we know this word from the scriptures, from the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the church at Philadelphia. And the word Philadelphia means city of brotherly love. And that's why, of course, that uh, we have the in our country, the city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that William Penn, who was a Quaker, a religious dissenter in England, and he wanted to have a place where people could come and coexist together without, you know, w- without having to try to harm one another. He wanted a place where there would be, God's love would be the order of the day. And so he established this community he had through his father's, uh, lineage. He had some type of property rights in the New World that the king had owed his father something, and so he couldn't pay it, so he gave him land instead. And so William Penn came over to, wasn't the United States then, but uh, came over and established this place, which we know today. Now the word philia is not used as much in Scripture, and it shouldn't be surprising that it isn't, because it's not talking about God's love. It's just talking about more a kind of love and respect, like we would say, like, you know, a a love for our country or something like that. And in John chapter 21, and after Jesus was uh, resurrected and he appeared to his disciples, as he was restoring Peter, he said, Peter, do you love me? And the word that he used there was agape. Do you agape me? And Peter responded back with, Lord, you know that I love you. But Peter did not respond with agape. He used the philia word, more like, like, I respect you and I esteem you. That kind of thing, which is interesting. We miss that in English, but uh, in other languages that's seen there. And so what does Jesus do? As you remember from that story, he asks Peter two more times, do you love me? Do you love me? And so we see there that they were not on the same plane, that God's love is so encompassing, that he loves everything about you and loves you in spite of all your sins and sent his son to die for you. And so in some instances, we can see that our love for God, we just cannot reciprocate. There's no way it can be matched. You know, just like that song that we just sing, the love of God, you know, is deeper far, and whatever the words were, the beautiful poetry that the world couldn't contain how much love God has for your soul. And so those are the two words in Scripture that we translate as love. And there were two other words not in the Scriptures that were in the Greek language. They had other concepts of love beyond these two. And one of these was called storge, and that was sort of like a love, like a, f- a friendship that people have for one another. So there was another concept of love. And then finally, the word that is not included in the scriptures, but it was very much present in the Greek society, was eros, E-R-O-S. And you're familiar with that term. We talk about you know, erotic or romantic or that kind of thing, and it's appealing to the senses. And so the Greek language had four words, where we only have 
one word. Now, some of these definitions were a little closer than others. It wasn't like there was neatly, like you would only use this word here and you would only use this word here. Like storge and um, philia are kind of close concepts, those words about sort of respect and esteem and love for your fellow man and those kinds of things. But there were other instances where it would be completely inappropriate to use one of those words for love in another context. And so we could see how that would make sense, that you wouldn't talk about eros for loving your sibling or your cousin. You wouldn't use agape. You wouldn't speak about God's love. Well, it was a name for a coffee shop in New London. You wouldn't speak about the contents of the coffee or the favorite thing to order on the menu there with the word agape. That just would make, wouldn't make sense. That would be inappropriate. So there are these different words for love, and it sort of shows us how complicated love can be, how complicated our interactions in love can be, that we're not kind to the ones whom we love the most, that there are people who are not even a part of our lives, but yet for some reason sometimes we care about them quite a bit, and we care about their opinion, and we don't want them to think poorly of us, and we want to put a good impression on them. And that's how our world is uh, messed up in many times. You make promises to be faithful to your spouse. And in these bonds, you build a house together, a household. You look out for one another in sickness and health. Those are those vows that you make in the marriage ceremony. But yet at the same time, too, while you say, this is the one whom I love, you know, this is the one who I'm committing my life to, and you are not so kind at times. What is perceived by as a loving suggestion by one spouse is often seen as a criticism by the other. As you know, that book, uh, Men Are From... Mars and women are from Venus. You know, how there just isn't that connection. And so it is then that Paul gave these words to us, not only in a sense for marriage. That's where you hear that text used the most. It's, it's a common scripture verse chosen for weddings. Maybe it was in your wedding if you were married. 1 Corinthians 13, that love is patient and love is kind. And every couple struggles with being patient and kind, especially when one starts to fail a little bit and the, and the one has to wait for the other and take care of the other, and uh, help the other one finish sentences because that one, the first one is getting confused. Husband is not always patient with his wife. A wife is not always kind. A wife can sometimes envy her husband's time. A husband can be rude in not considering his wife's feelings, and so on and so on. So this is why we need all four kinds of love. Yes, we only have one word for it in our English language. But we need all these different concepts of love. They need to all be present because it just can't be one. It can't be the other. If your marriage only is romantic love, but you don't have love to honor your spouse in the small moments of life and to take care of his or her needs, then you really do not have love. It's just like a clanging cymbal, as the scriptures say. Or if we as Christians, if we say that we love our neighbors as ourselves, but then don't talk to our neighbors, or don't care for our neighbors. If you say, I love the world because Jesus loves the world, but then you speak negatively about everybody all the time and only enjoy talking about others when it's gossip or putting somebody down, then you do not have love, as the scriptures remind us of so importantly. So it is then, with thinking on love, that we remember that while you and I often fail in our relationships with one another, and in something as complicated as marriage or as something as simple as being nice to somebody when you see them and saying a kind word, in all these ways we fail. But there is one love that is above all others, a love that uh, will not let us go, and that is the love of Jesus Christ. And we know that Jesus Christ is all loving because he loved us when we were completely unlovable. As we think of Jesus on the cross, what did he say as he was looking down upon those who were speaking words of derision to him? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That is true love. That is true devotion and concern. That is true charity, as the King James Version of the Bible tells us. That your sins are atoned for because Jesus Christ was willing to, to die on the cross, to stand in your place for all your shortcomings, for all the times that you have failed to love others, and for all the times that you have failed to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, as Jesus said. Because Jesus Christ has won eternal life on the cross 
for you, we are called then to love, as Christ tells us to love one another. As Paul wrote, love one another that your joy may be full. This is the way of Christ. And in your sinful state, it's often hard to live in that kind of loving attitude, that you don't want to forgive others. You don't want to love others. It's a lot easier to hate somebody and be mad at somebody and to how do, what is that we call when, when, when you're mad at somebody and I can't think of the concept right now I just lost the word but anyway when you want to when, you, when you're so upset at that person it's just easier to kind of hold it against that person than it is to say I forgive you and I love you even though I'm not feeling the love right now I don't like you at this moment but I love you because Christ loves me and if he can love me with his infinite love that uh, the world cannot hold then certainly I can forgive you and love you. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. Rejoices in the truth. That's important too, because so often in this world today, we have seen the negative effects of our shallow description of love or our overly expansive word for love in English. We have a hard time being specific about it. Like I mentioned earlier about saying I love God and I love pepperoni pizza. And so it is many times, many times that we mix up what love really is. And we think that love is just making people happy and keeping people content. But it's love does not delight in evil. It rejoices in the truth. And so that's why we talk about tough love as parents and in the church as well. That even if somebody is a dear friend, to us that if such a person is creating a great trouble in the congregation that on rare occasions that we have to say we love you too much for you to endure what you're doing or you as a parent even maybe you've been a part of this in some type of uh, intervention where you've had to say I love you so much that I have to not have you be a part of my life right now until you stop drinking or doing drugs or whatever that Sometimes love is not just valentines, hearts and kisses, warm, fuzzy feelings. Sometimes it's not just affirming everything that that person says or does. But sometimes the real loving thing is to speak truth. Because what would it have been like for you and me if Jesus had just come to earth and had just said, I love you all, keep doing what you're doing? What would it be like for your soul if you read the Bible and you open it up as God's love letter and it just said, there, there, keep going. Or, you know, if it was just some fuzzy, empty, vacuous affirmation for you, it might feel good for a second, but would it really bring any peace to your soul? Would you really have true love for God if you knew that God didn't really care about how you feel about him? It would just evaporate into some type of vague sense of, I guess God loves me, and then you wouldn't care about it. But you love God because he has done great things for you, not only because he created you and has breathed the breath of life into your soul, but you love God because he sent his son, Jesus Christ, and because he was faithful, even when you haven't been faithful. And so it is, then, that we can grasp, each one of you, you can grasp the depth and the width and the height of God's love, as the scriptures tell us, because you know how much God loves your soul in spite of how often you would deny him totally. As verse 7 and 8 of 1 Corinthians 13 say to you this morning, love always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres, love never fails. And that is certainly God's love. Because there are times in life where you have felt that all love has failed you. Maybe you've been through a divorce. Maybe you had a best friend who has turned his back or her back on you and you thought that you'd, you know, you'd grown up together, gone to school together, worked together for many years, and now that person has betrayed you. The list could go on. Maybe your children have stolen from you. Maybe your children have brought great shame and it's been nothing but a lifetime of a family life of tears and heartache and sorrow. Maybe everything that has come your way in life has had to come with three times the effort that everybody else has had to put forth to have some type of some meaningful life and to, to support yourself. 
And so it is then, it's easy for us to become embittered. It's easy for us to think of love and become skeptical and think, ah, love, that's just something that people who sort of have pie in the sky by and by. So that's not the kind of love that we're talking about. It's not just that warm sentiment. It's not just that warm fuzzy. It's that assurance and knowledge and belief in your soul that Jesus Christ has gone the entire way for you, has gone even into eternal life and has prepared a way for you so that you can one day make it there too because he loves you and he wants to be with you because you want to be around with those who love you. You know, that's why funerals are so hard in many ways. That even though that that person, you uh, are glad to see that their pain and suffering might be done, that their earthly sickness is over, you want to be with the people you love. And that's why it hurts. You want to have those who are around you be the ones whom you love. And so that shows us that Jesus loves us because he wants us to be with him in eternity. So claim Christ's love for yourself. Do not simply give it lip service like so many people do. They would, if many people, if you ask them, do you love God? They say, well, yeah, I love God. Well, how would God know that you love him? And they probably would have to stop and think about that for a minute. So show your love. Show your love to God. Tell him that you love him. Act as if you love him. Live as if you love him. Let other people see Christ's love in you. You know, that's the thing about our society is in many ways that Yes, we sometimes have to say, no, this is not a good thing for you to pursue in your life. We have things that we know are right and wrong in this world. But at the same time, the world often perceives us then as being judgmental or being negative or being people who are always looking for something wrong about the world. And that's where that balance has to be struck because people should see God's love in you. It should be obvious. You know those people in your life whom you have known, who have been important, faithful witnesses uh, in your life who the love of God just radiated from that person. You hardly met that person when you first got to know him or her. And you could just see that person had love in himself or herself that was just uh, contagious. And so it should be with each one of us that the love of God should just bubble over in us. It's hard to do sometimes, you know, with life, with all its pains, with all its struggles, when the ones whom you love are no longer with you at the moment, and it's easy to become discouraged. But we love because first Christ loved us. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so it is then that we finish, we close this morning with these words, Beloved, let us love one another, for love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love God does not know God, because God is love. So just as I began with that, I end with these same words this morning, that you would love God, that your love would be profound for God, that you would love him not just when things are easy, but that you would love him when things are tough, just as he loved you, even though you have pushed him away so many times. Let's pray about that this morning. Lord God, Heavenly Father, as we in this nation have this day set aside to think about love and to share greetings and cards and candy and all those things, with one another, we pray, Lord God, that uh, we would be reminded of what true love is. And that, Lord, that that is a part of love and affection and, and romance are certainly part of a love. But, Lord, we remember that there is something so much greater and of such a larger importance than, than simply a, a candy greeting or a friendly hug or a kiss, Lord, that, uh, that your love is what uh, sustains each one of us, that even when this world can be so unloving, that even when we do things in our lives that are so contrary to what you would have us do, that you thank you, Lord, that you love us enough to keep taking us back, that your grace is sufficient, that you love each one of us with a love that is everlasting, that cannot be measured in this world. And so we pray, Lord God, that you would work on each one of our hearts today, that we'd be more loving people, that we'd be people who would engage and speak about tough love when it's necessary, but that we would also speak words of comfort, words of friendship, words of reconciliation, Lord, that people would see in us that there is a kind of love in our hearts and in our souls that cannot be found in any other place in this world. That, Lord, that you remember that we remember that you have told us in your word that uh, you give not as the world gives. And so, Lord God, we pray that that love would be inside each one of us today, too, that we would 
show that love not only to those whom we love in return, but, uh, Lord, that, uh, that we would love even those who would hate us. We pray, Lord God, that this love would continue to abide in our hearts today and always, that it would not be some temporary sensation, but, Lord, that it would be an everlasting love, just as your love is from everlasting to everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.